Every once in a while, you encounter an individual who is able to, able to offer logical, consistent, and evidence-supported argumentation, and yet you don't buy a word of what they say, such as my reaction to Peter Singer. Indeed, Singer is a clear thinker, a great writer, and probably a really good-hearted guy, but for the life of me, I can't accept the conclusions he comes to. They strike me as completely absurd. I am not alone in this conviction. Indeed, other philosophers, for instance Karl Marx and Honora O'Neill, consider the same issue Singer does and come to radically different conclusions. But before attempting to show how these philosophers differ from and thus offer a critique of Singer, I must practice what I have been preaching throughout this semester. Namely, I must first offer a fair outline of the position under critique, namely Singer's. So let's move on to this argument. Singer begins by observing a certain fact, namely, in our world and in all past worlds, there have always been extremely poor people. Indeed, there have always been people who are starving, dying, and suffering for no other reason than a lack of resources. Singer, writing in the 70s, points to starving Bengal refugees as an example. We, of course, could think of our own examples, victims of the genocide in Darfur, the slum dwellers of Asia and Africa, and so on. Unfortunately, the fact of world poverty is not a hard fact to establish. Next, Singer makes the further claim that this fact of poverty is a morally bad thing. In other words, Singer claims that extreme poverty gets in the way of living a good life. Now, this claim adds an ethical to dim dimension to what in the first place was simply a factual observation. Indeed, saying that poverty exists is not an ethical claim, while saying that poverty is bad is an ethical claim. If you can't see why the latter claim here is ethical, just think about the difference between saying that Granny Smith apples exist and that Granny Smith apples are bad. These are very obviously quite different claims. So then, it is an argumentative move for Singer to jump from the observation that poverty exists to the claim that poverty is bad. Singer does not really offer support for this move, but as he observes, he doesn't really have to. Indeed, I don't think we can disagree with Singer that there is in fact something morally wrong with the existence of extreme poverty. Okay, so at this point, Singer has established that poverty exists and that it is, it is a bad thing. His argument now takes a new turn, a turn which should make sense in a second. Namely, Singer proposes what he believes to be a rather intuitively obvious ethical rule. This rule says that if it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. If it isn't clear why Singer thinks this rule is so obvious, we need only think of an example. Imagine, then, that you are walking down the road in a new suit and see a person trapped in a burning building next to you. You know you can save this person and thus prevent something bad, but also know that the rescue operation will result in the destruction of your new suit. Singer's point is that it is rather obvious that even though you will have to sacrifice your new clothes, you are still ethically obligated to save the person. This is because a pair of shoes and a person's life are not morally comparable. Now, assuming we accept Singer's rule that if it is in our power, if it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought to morally to do it, we must notice two important characteristics of this rule. First, the rule sees distance as irrelevant. It is morally irrelevant, in other words, whether or not we are close or far to the bad things that need to be prevented. So, for instance, if you were somehow able to save the person from the fire from a distance, let's say using a remote-controlled helicopter, your distance from the fire would in no way take away your moral obligation to save the person. Second, in addition to seeing distance as irrelevant, the rule sees other people's moral obligations as irrelevant. Let's say, for instance, that there are a whole bunch of people standing around the burning house in their new suits. Just because they also are obligated to save the person from the fire does not mean that you are not obligated to save the person. Indeed, while acting according to this rule, other people's moral obligations have no bearing on your own. Now, Singer proposes, having thus fleshed out a rather obvious rule for ethical action, let's apply it to our observations about poverty. Poverty, remember, is bad. Remembering that our rule for ethical action says that if we are able to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral worth, we ought to do it. We can therefore see that, since poverty is bad, as long as we can prevent it, we are obligated to do so, as long as we are not thereby sacrificing anything of great moral value. Now, the first thing we should ask about this rule is whether or not we are in fact able to prevent poverty. The rule only applies to bad things we actually are able to prevent. Singer's answer is, of course we can prevent poverty. Indeed, almost everyone in the developed world has access to resources far beyond their needs. Most of us have more than one pair of shoes and eat more than rice and beans every day. 
Furthermore, through the work of modern aid organizations, it is extremely easy for us to donate these resources and so, at least partially, prevent poverty. Each one of us could, for example, save a poor person right now simply by donating $20 a month to an organization like Oxfam or UNICEF. Okay, so we do have the ability to prevent poverty, but we must then further ask, in preventing poverty, are we going to have to sacrifice anything of comparable moral importance? Indeed, if preventing poverty means making great moral sacrifices, then we are not required to do so. However, Singer points out, as long as we are only sacrificing our, wa sacrificing our wants and not our needs, then preventing poverty does not require us to sacrifice anything even close to the moral value of a person's life. Indeed, Singer points out, a starving child's life is vastly more valuable than any of our wants, vastly more important than a new pair of clothes, a night out at a steakhouse, or even financial security. Therefore, according to Singer, since we are able to prevent poverty without making morally comparable sacrifices, we are morally obligated to donate everything we do not need to the extremely poor. This is because, remember, the lives of the poor have much more moral importance than the resources we have access to that extend beyond our basic needs. Furthermore, Singer continues, the two characteristics of the rule for ethical action investigated above still apply when the rule is concerned with poverty, namely distance and the obligations to other people are irrelevant and the obligations of other people are irrelevant to our moral obligation to prevent poverty. It is morally irrelevant, in other words, that most of the extremely poor live across the world and that everyone with adequate resources has an equal obligation to help them. What all this means is that for Singer, donating all of our resources beyond our basic means to the poor is not merely an act of charity, it is, it is an ethical obligation. Indeed, according to Singer, each one of us is morally obligated to donate almost everything we own, all our extra resources, in order to prevent poverty. Doing this is an obligation for Singer in precisely the same way as it is an obligation for us to tell the truth and refrain from murder. This is because, as we have seen, poverty is something bad, and we are morally obligated to prevent bad things as long as we do not have to sacrifice anything of comparable more importance in order to do so. But if this is in fact true, then unless there are some of you out there who only own one pair of shoes, eat only rice and beans, and so on, each one of us is morally corrupt. Admittedly, Singer's argument here is extremely logical and in a way highly motivating. There is certainly a reason it is a standard of ethics classes. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, there is for me a certain odor of falseness about it, an olfactory omen, if you will. Now I could offer my own critique of Singer, however, it is, I feel it is more appropriate to allow sharper minds to do so, namely the minds of Karl Marx and Honora O'Neill. Karl Marx's basic claim is that modern society is divided in two along class lines. The lower of these two classes, which obviously includes the extremely poor, is denied the good life simply because they belong to the lower class. In this way, then, Marx agrees with Singer that poverty is bad, that poverty and the good life do not mix well. However, for Marx, poverty is only a symptom of a deeper problem, namely the problem of class division. Indeed, for Marx, poverty is to class division as a runny nose is to a cold. The former are but symptoms of the latter true problems. Here then, Marx would argue, argue is where Singer goes wrong. For in his proposition to donate all of our extra resources to the poor, Singer is attempting to treat the symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. For Marx, Singer is like the physician who treats a patient's cold by giving him a tissue. Sure, a tissue will help with the symptom of the runny nose, but will do nothing to help cure the cold itself. A true cold cure for a cold, for a true cure for a runny nose must go after the cold, just as a true cure for poverty must go after class division. In short, then, Marx would say that Singer is misguided because donating all our extra resources to the poor would never succeed at fixing the real problem of modern society, the problem of class division. O'Neill takes a rather different route of critiquing Singer. Namely, O'Neill, being a Kantian, says that all people, including the poor, must be treated as ends in themselves. In other words, the poor must be cared for for their own sake, not for the sake of something else. But Singer, O'Neill would point out, does suggest caring for the poor for the sake of something else. Indeed, while it admittedly sounds odd, Singer wants to care for the poor in order to alleviate poverty. To put it differently, the suggestion that we all donate to the poor in order to remedy poverty ultimately suggests using a poor, the poor as a means to the end of remedying poverty, rather than as treating the poor as ends in themselves. To put it still another way, O'Neill would point out that Singer is so concerned about poverty he completely forgets about the poor. 
With this, we wrap up our unit on poverty and class. If nothing else, I hope it has succeeded in showing you that poverty and class are important ethical issues.